Good evening. Welcome to our first program in the Winchester Academy's Summer 2021 series. My name is Colin Mitchell. I am a trustee of Winchester Academy. We'd like to take a moment to thank the city of Wapaka and our producer, Josh Werner, for providing the space and technology to bring this program to you. Our next program topic is racial wealth and equity with Chuck Self. It will be in one week, Monday, June 14th. Tonight's program is sponsored by Dick Hansen, who is here in the studio with us tonight. Thank you, Dick. We will have a question and answer session following Tracy's presentation tonight. Questions may be submitted via the Facebook Live site or by telephone. The phone number is 715-942-9917. Again, that is 715-942-9917. 9917. Our speaker tonight is Tracy Hames. Tracy was raised in Minnesota, where he developed a love and appreciation for nature and the environment through many years of hunting, fishing, and camping. Tracy obtained a BA in biology and environmental studies from McAllister College in 1984, and an MS in natural resources from UW Stevens Point in 1990. In 1989, he moved to work as a waterfowl and wetlands biologist for the Yakima Indian Nation, where he stayed for 22 years. At Yakima, he built one of the largest agricultural-based wetland protection and restoration projects in the Pacific Northwest. This project, located in two of the most productive steelhead-producing watersheds in the Yakima River Basin, made use of cultures and traditions of the Yakima people along with science-based techniques to produce an approach to restoration, combining traditional knowledge and ecological concepts. This project, encompassing over 22,000 acres and hundreds of miles of rivers and creeks, emphasized the restoration of historic conditions in an incredibly disturbed landscape. Restoration activities targeted floodplains, river and creek channels, wetlands, riparian forest, and grasslands. A Midwesterner at heart, Tracy moved back to Wisconsin in 2012 to take the position of executive director with Wisconsin Wetlands Association. In this position, he works across the state to help communities understand how wetlands can be solutions to the habitat, water quality, flooding, and other issues they face. On behalf of the Winchester Academy, it is my pleasure to welcome Tracy Hames. Thank you. That was the long version of my uh, biography. So <laughs> hope we still have some time left. Uh, 
Well, welcome everybody, and uh, thanks uh, for coming out, all of you that are here. This is the first face-to-face -face, uh, presentation I've done since the beginning of the pandemic, so I'm so happy and excited to see human beings in the room. So we will dive right in, and uh, i got a lot of slides, and we'll talk about a lot of things, and hopefully uh, we'll uh, have a good discussion. So uh, once again, we're talking about wetlands as solutions to Wisconsin's water issues. Uh, briefly, our organization, Wisconsin Wetlands Association, uh, we're a nonprofit, science based, nonpartisan, non governmental uh, statewide membership organization. If you like wetlands and you're interested in this stuff, we'd love to have you as a member. Uh, that's what helps us uh, be able to come and do these types of presentations around the state. Uh, we are 50 years old, so we've been around since uh, 1969. Um, in a nutshell, we help communities care and uh, uh, protect their wetlands. So let's start out by saying, you know, what are wetlands? I always like to start with this slide because a lot of people have different ideas. And if you talk to scientists, wetland people, uh, they'll give you these long definitions of with hydrology and soils and plants and all these different things about what a wetland is. I want you all to remember one thing tonight Wetlands are those areas in between the places that are always dry and the places that are always wet. And because of that, you get a great diversity of wetland types, especially in Wisconsin, some closer to the always dry, some closer to the always wet. And the types of plants and animals and soil conditions within that spectrum is different uh, depending on, on where you are on that, on that range. <clears throat> oh, there it is right there, see? Always dry and always wet. So let's start out by talking about some of the major uh, types of wetlands in Wisconsin. We're an incredibly diverse state. It's really fun working in Wisconsin because you never get bored. Go to one part of the state is very different than the other parts of the state. And uh, for a guy like me, uh, you get a lot of diversity. <clears throat> First of all, most of us, when we think of wetlands, we think of these things, marshes and deep water wetlands. We think of an open water area with cattails or other emergent plants around it and a bunch of ducks or herons or egrets uh, standing around in the water. Those are marshes and deep water habitats. We have a lot of other types of wetlands as well. These are very important wetlands, especially for wildlife, uh, but we'll talk about other types of wetlands as well. Sedge meadows and low prairies. These are a little bit closer to the drier end, but they're still pretty wet. And uh, oftentimes there isn't a lot of visual standing open water in these things. Incredibly diverse uh, floristically and incredibly beautiful. Um, when you go out to a meadow like this one, each month of the year you'll see different types of plants in bloom. And it changes all the time. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And really high diversity and high quality for, habit, uh, for wildlife as well. Uh, historically, huge part of the state was sedge meadows and low prairies. Of course, they've been lost uh, due to a lot of development. We've lost so much of them. And in, in, these, uh, in these prairies, I always like to talk about the northern harrier. Harrier is a, you know, it's a hawk, uh, raptor, and uh, I'm an old duck biologist. So one of the things that duck biologists do is we go out and look for duck nests, and they nest in fields and things like that. Well, when you're out looking for duck nests, oftentimes you'll find a harrier nest, and quite often in, in good areas. And a harrier nest is wide open to, this, to the air. It's not hidden like a duck nest, straight up to the sky. And, and it looks just like this. When you find one of those nests, you'll see three or four little babies right like that, sitting there wide open. <clears throat> one thing that we found, and it's not a lot of this in the literature, but the experience of us duck biologists know this just from, from being out there all the time, is you start to find duck nests all around the harrier nest. Well, why is that? Well, you go back later to see if that duck nest had hatched, and you find out why. Those harriers come out and just about take your head off. They protect that whole area from other predators. And though a lot of people consider this bird a predator as well, it's actually very useful to allow the success of other birds. Maybe there's a harrier tax, maybe they take a few ducklings, but overall uh, the success of ground nesting birds uh, is dependent on, on things like that. And that's the kind of stuff that goes on in some of these low prairies and, and sedge meadows. Floodplain forests, another really important uh, 
wetland type in Wisconsin. Uh, think of the lower Wisconsin River. That's a really good example of that. And it's the areas flat along these riverways or creeks or streams where in the spring during rain events, the water just spreads out, slows down. Oftentimes there's gallery uh, uh, silver maple and, and other trees in there and uh, very gorgeous, very diverse. There'll be side channels and sloughs and wetlands and little islands of upland areas. And oftentimes beavers are holding the whole thing together uh, with their beaver dams. Forested wetlands, these are the true swamps. Many of us, when we talk about wetlands, we use the term swamp. A swamp is actually a wetland that has wood in it, uh, woody growth. Uh, so we have a lot of different types of swamps, uh, uh, spruce swamps, cedar swamps, uh, black ash swamps, etc. cetera. Uh, so when you think of uh, wooded wetlands, those are our true swamps. Shrub thickets, I always like to show this picture because if you haven't been in a shrub thicket, this is alder, but we also have shrub car, which is willow and other things. They're thick. Uh, also really good habitat and really important for helping protect uh, some of the edges of our waterways. Uh, so I would uh, encourage any of you that haven't walked through a shrub thicket to please do so. And uh, you really get a, uh, an impression of, of what it really is, uh, this type of thicket. Get out of the car, get off the road, walk on through there. You probably need hip boots at least. Fens. Fens are inc incredibly rare wetlands. Very few of them left in Wisconsin, especially in the southern part of the state, they were more common. And fens are these, is, is in a situation, especially where you have like limestone or dolomite and there'll be a crack or a fissure and the groundwater will come up and spread out in an area. And because oftentimes they're calcareous, there'll be certain plants that grow there that don't grow anywhere else because they're adapted to that, those water types. And over the centuries and even thousands of years, as that source of water comes up out of the ground, bubbles and the vegetation growth grows and the peat mats uh, develop, they get higher and higher and higher. And the, and the spring will keep going up through, the, through that peat and, and provide the hydrology to the wetland. And so a fen is a situation you can actually go out. Think of wetlands, you know, right? The low areas on the landscape because that's where the water collects. Fens can be mounds. So oftentimes you'll be in a fen mound, you'll be walking uphill, you'll be standing up looking down at the rest of the landscape. Very, very unique. Unfortunately, almost all of them have been lost. So if you, if you know of some fen areas, seek them out. The Whitewater area, area has some really good fens in this area and, and unbelievably gorgeous, diverse plants in there. Unique plants too. Bogs. Uh, a lot of glaciers came through here right over the years and oftentimes a big chunk of ice would, would stay and, and melt and make a deep area. Bogs are acidic, a really hard area for plants and other things to live in because of the water conditions there. So certain plants also just like fens are adapted to these acidic or alkaline or acidic conditions. And because it's such a harsh environment, some of the plants have actually developed carnivorous uh, uh, characteristics. So they've got to get, you know, get their energy and protein another way than just getting it out of the out of the water. So they're catching bugs and ants and things. Think of pitcher plants, think of sundews and things like that. So very, very unique, interesting, and pretty abundant yet up in the northern part of the state. Ephemeral and seasonal ponds. Uh, these are the ones that are most um, these are wetlands that are most unrecognizable to people. These are the areas, especially low spots in, on the landscape, oftentimes in wooded areas where snowmelt and spring rains will collect. And, and it'll hold on to that water and allow it to slowly soak into the ground. Incredibly important, and we'll talk about uh, why in a minute, but they really help gather the runoff so it isn't flushing down into our lakes and rivers, bringing all that junk along with it. Um, allowing the water to soak into the ground. But because they're ephemeral, they don't persist wet all year long, people don't recognize them as wetlands. Uh, so here you see the same uh, photo in the four areas. Uh, upper left is uh, early spring, upper right, later spring, summer, and then fall. And so uh, the importance of these wetlands, not only to holding runoff and helping reduce uh, flood flows, also really important for amphibians, um, these guys right here. So the reason 
these uh, wetlands are so important to amphibians is think about this. If you're a frog or a salamander, you want to have a place that's safe, right, to lay your eggs. Nothing's going to eat your eggs. Well, pick an ephemeral wetland because they're going to dry up. So as soon as the snow is off in a lot of these wetlands, these guys are doing their business. They're cranking their eggs out because they know eventually that thing's going to dry up. But it's the fact that it dries up and there's no fish in there that allows them successfully to, uh, to raise their babies. But it's a race sometimes. Some dry up faster than others. And sometimes, some years you'll have your ephemerals maybe wet all, all year long. Other times in a drier year, they'll, be, they'll dry up very quickly. So what good are wetlands? These guys know what wetlands are good for, these little baby wood ducks, but why are they good for you and me? Why should we care about wetlands? So let's talk about that a little bit. So I wanna start by uh, showing a quick video about how wetlands are important to managing the water that flows across our watershed. And I need someone to help me. I need someone to click, uh, click the button there. I, I, sorry, I forgot I was gonna arrange this at the beginning. Just try and click return see what oh see if that does it or use a cursor there's a there's a little arrow about a third of the way up on the left hand side you sh the arrow will show up if you bring the cursor there talk amongst yourself folks <laughs> there we go do you remember fishing with your grandpa catching frogs at the water's edge some of these precious childhood memories of nature tie back to wetlands. Wetlands occur between the places that are always wet and the places that are always dry. Not only do they give us great memories, they also protect the health and safety of our communities. They reduce flood damages, help keep our waters clean, and ensure we have water to drink and use in our businesses. But the ability of wetlands to provide these benefits depends on how we use and manage our land and water. Across much of the state, the changes we have made to our landscape have disrupted this ability. And as a result, we're seeing more flood damages and water quality problems. The good news is that wetlands can be an important part of the solutions to these problems. And by understanding how wetlands work, we can begin the exciting process of restoring wetlands to help heal Wisconsin's waters. Because water flows downhill, we can't fix issues downstream if we don't fix problems upstream. So let's start at the top and look at how it's all connected, the watershed. A watershed is an area where all surface waters, lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands drain to a shared body of water. But wetlands in different parts of a watershed manage water in different ways. Wetlands in the upper parts of a watershed form in low spots on the land. These wetlands capture, store, and slowly release runoff from rain and snowmelt. They may not always look like wetlands. They're wet in spring and dry by late summer, and often they don't even appear to be connected to streams or rivers, but they are critical. Here's how. Individually, these wetlands may be small, but they can be locally abundant. Together, they hold and manage a lot of water and literally slow the flow, allowing the water to soak into the ground. This reduces erosion and flood peaks and helps protect downstream roads and neighborhoods. Wetlands in the middle part of a watershed form along rivers and creeks, giving them room to swell during high water. They are most commonly known as floodplain wetlands. When floodwaters spread out across a floodplain, they slow down and spread out. Slow removing water has less erosion causing energy and water that can spread out means lower flood peaks downstream. Wetlands in the lower parts of a watershed form where rivers empty into larger bodies of water, especially lakes. Where rivers flatten out, the current disperses and the river drops its load of sediments and other material. This makes the water that enters the lake cleaner and clearer, which means better fishing, swimming, and boating. So are the wetlands near you healthy and abundant enough to support watershed health, or are they too damaged to do the work you need them to do? If you don't know the answer, you're not alone. But if you're concerned about water quality and flooding and care about fish and wildlife, encouraging your community to explore how local wetlands are or are not supporting watershed health is a great place to start. Working together, we can use wetlands as solutions in our communities. And at the same time, we can ensure that our kids and grandkids 
create the same treasured childhood memories we hold dear. So I always like to show this video. Let's go to the next slide. Oops. Oh, now it did work with the clicker. What do you know? <laughs> um, I always like to show this because wetlands do different things in different parts, and we'll talk a lot about that uh, tonight. And But it's really important to take a watershed perspective. That video we made a few years ago, it's been really popular. Uh, and uh, if you would like to, re to view it again, go on our website, wisconsinwetlands.org, and uh, find our videos. There's a lot of videos on there, but that's one of them. So uh, it's a good good basic primer primer for the uh, how wetlands hand, handle water. But think about wetlands, think about watersheds, think about where wetlands are or are not in the watershed. And when you look at our landscapes, a lot of the wetland loss, and we'll talk about more about this in a minute, uh, occurred in the upper areas. And uh, all those wetlands that capture the flow and uh, and slow that flow down, and the floodplains as well have been lost. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about that, and you'll hear me using terms like upper watershed wetlands and floodplains and things like that in this talk. So the upper watershed is critical, just like the video said. 80% of the water that flows through a watershed starts in the upper watershed area. And historically, Wisconsin, you know, had very abundant upper watershed wetlands. And here's a pothole wetland. Who knew we had pothole wetlands in Wisconsin? But we do. In, in one part of, the, part of the state, this is St. Croix County, um, they capture that and, and they're wet in the spring and it soaks into the ground or evaporates and, and uh, keeps that water from going downstream. Mid-watershed floodplains also important. We'll talk about uh, how, the, how they work here in a minute. But this is a photo from the Driftless area. Driftless area has lost almost all of its floodplains, its lower uh, watershed floodplains. A lot of the uh, Driftless streams and creeks in Wisconsin looked like this. It was a snaky channel or multi ch multiple channels flowing through a big sedge meadow. And uh, big sponges is what they were. And uh, you didn't hear much before development happened about big floods because these situations can really take a lot of precipitation and the water comes down and just kind of soaks into that uh, sponge and uh, works its way downstream slowly. So wetlands protect our communities from flooding. You know, unfortunately, we've put our, a lot of uh, our human uh, structures in places that used to flood and we don't want them to flood. And we've also, like I said, developed a lot of wetlands upstream, and that water now comes down and floods places that uh, we don't want to flood as well. So putting wetlands back on the landscape, protecting the wetlands we could have, helps prevent things like this. <clears throat> this is a graph, because this is a science talk, uh, I have to, I'm obliged to show at least one graph. So. This is a hydrograph, which means the flow of water through a river. And this is actually back uh, from my old job when I used to work at Yakima Nation. This is the Yakima River, a hydrograph. So the blue line is, is the flow of the Yakima River at, in a town called Parker. And the green line is the flow of the river in Grandview, which is about 30 miles downstream from Parker. And this is, uh, this is over the course of just one week where there was a big rain on snow event in the middle of, middle of winter where you get a big warm air mass coming over the, uh, out of the Pacific, drop it on the Cascade Mountains where this is a Cascade uh, a mountain watershed, and all that snow comes down all at once. So above Parker, you have the city of Yakima and a lot of places where the floodplain's been lost. So all that water came down and rose really fast at Parker and then dropped really fast, as you can see in the blue. Downstream, look at the, the same amount of water passed through Parker that passed through Grandview later, but look at the, the, the height, uh, the amount of flow at any one time. It was about 30% reduction in the flood, flood peak in Grandview and Parker. Well, how can that be, especially if Grandview is downstream? In between Parker and Grandview is one of the places I worked, big, broad floodplain areas. So that water that... that that fire hose water that hit Parker and raised really high, it spread out in between those two towns and slowed it down. You see the rise is much slower and the peak is much uh, lower, and then it took a longer time to, to spread on down. That's what wetlands do. They capture that flow, they slow it down, they reduce flood peaks. 
Now, I'm looking for good examples like this in Wisconsin. I haven't found any good ones yet, so partially because we don't have a lot of good uh, water measuring capabilities in this state yet, and not as much as they do out, out west. Wetlands reduce runoff energy. So here's a place up uh, near Ashland um, coming out of the Pinocchio Hills where above this area where these dogs are hanging out, uh, there's been wetland loss. The upper, wet, upper watershed wetlands were removed and all that water flushed down and it hit this area. And this was one rain event caused this big gully and there was so much water flowing through. Once again, a, a snow event, a fast melt uh, situation with rain and it blew this big chasm out and a uh, big part of that is because uh, of the wetland loss upstream from here. And the way it works is wetlands and especially floodplains provide friction. So think of this, when water sp spreads out over a floodplain area, there's grass, there's wetland vegetation, there's all this stuff in the way of flow and so it slows it down, it captures that and the sediment drops out and it's literally friction across the landscape. So it's similar to this, this poor guy on the upper left, somebody tossed him out of the airplane, there's not much friction to slow him down. When he hits the ground, that's gonna hurt. Well, if he had a parachute, what does a parachute do? It provides the friction, allows him the safe landing. Exact same concept for rivers and channels. The bottom left is, is one where the wetlands have been gone and it's, uh, it's a big flashy uh, uh, messed up area versus, versus on the right where you have a much more uh, energetically uh, reduced uh, situation. Wetlands also improve water quality, and we're really learning a lot about that now, especially in agricultural areas. Uh, here's, a, here's an ephemeral wetland that uh, in these places, you know, you get a lot of carbon and, and stuff coming out from leaf litter, and it's right where the water meets the mud is, mud is where all the action goes on. There's bugs in there and, and bacteria and all these things that are chewing up and processing those nutrients. What we're finding now in agricultural lands is that incorporating wetlands back in the landscape in the right locations in combination with traditional uh, agricultural conservation practices like swales and cover crops increases the water uh, quality uh, capabilities of the landscape tenfold. So and just by incorporating wetlands makes our other practices so much, so much more effective. And we're just starting to move that direction now. And uh, it's really exciting times uh, for wetlands, especially in agricultural areas. Here's, here's a picture, wetlands clean agricultural runoff. These two photos were taking, taken at you know, three minutes apart on one side of a road to the other. On the left-hand side is some water that's flowing off an agricultural field. And you can see you know, how dirty it is and it's coming right out and that's going right down into the river. On the other side of the road, there's a wetland filtering that runoff. Uh, same place, same event, same storm event. And look at the difference in, uh, in the quality of water coming out of there. Not losing a lot of soil on the, on the right-hand side. Wetlands also protect our shorelines. Uh, wind and wave action and, and even flood flows, you know, can really uh, erode our banks and cause a lot of problems when we maintain the wetlands there, you know, not putting our lawns right to the shoreline, et cetera, uh, can really make a difference. And wetlands store carbon. And this is another thing that, you know, the science is really starting to increase on. Here's a, an, an old muck farm in Wisconsin. We had a lot of muck farms developed, you know, 100 years ago. And what they did, they would drain these big, peaty wetlands and deep drains. It took a lot of work to get these things dry enough to farm. And uh, when we farmed that and, and uh, exposed all that soil that used to be covered in water, we lost the carbon. Carbon went up into the air. And uh, because the way wetlands store carbon is they have anoxic conditions. That means conditions without oxygen. So when the plant matter uh, falls into the water, it doesn't decay like it would in an oxygenated environment. So all the carbon that's in that vegetation then over hundreds and thousands of years really builds up and that creates those peats and those muck soils. You drain them out, expose that to air, tilling, all the other stuff, you're gonna lose that carbon. So carbon that was stored for hundreds or thousands of years can be lost in, mere, in a few decades when we expose that to air. There are muck farms out there that you'll, you can go out and I've been on them talking to the farmers and they'll say, yeah, we started this muck farm in the 40s and since then it has dropped six feet in elevation. Well, how does that happen? 
because you're losing all that organic matter and uh, gets to the point sometimes where they can't even till it anymore because, because of that loss. A lot of carbon that was stored back into the atmosphere. So bringing wetlands back in the right conditions under the right soil and hydrologic conditions can uh, be very beneficial uh, for storing carbon. Wetlands enhance trout habitat, of course. Uh, there's so many really nice trout streams in Wisconsin and they're, and they're groundwater fed. And when you have healthy wetlands, especially in the upper watershed portions of these uh, waterways, that helps grab that water and suck it into the ground. And that then moves down through the, the ground into the, into the trout stream later on in the heat of the summer when the trout need that cold water. And the rule is cold water in, cold water out. So if you're capturing snow melt and early spring rain, guess what? That's cold water. So if you allow that to infiltrate into the ground, that's moving through. The ground acts like a refrigerator. It's coming out in July and August, cold water, and the fish know where those areas are. If you lose those wetlands and all that water goes flushing down, then you're sending that water out and out of the watershed, and it's not available uh, to those fish later on. This is Bulgus Creek up in the Pinocchio Hills. And uh, the other beautiful thing about this trout stream is uh, it's got a really nice sedge meadow floodplain. So this photo was taken in July. I was out there in my hip boots and I was slogging through about knee deep water through this gorgeous tussock sedge meadow. And I wanted to get to the trout creek, class one trout stream. And I thought, oh, I'll stand in the creek and I'll take a picture of the, of the channel and the floodplain on either side. And I took one step and whoosh, went right up to my neck. And that got me really excited. And why? because that was a deep, narrow channel with overhanging banks, perfect trout habitat. And that habitat was only there because the wetlands were helping protect that, reducing the energy. If you removed these wetlands, then you would have all that water coming down and the channel couldn't handle that amount of you know, runoff flow, so it would change its shape. And usually the way channels change their shape when they've got too much flow flowing down them is they either get wider or they dig themselves deeper or both. And uh, that removes a lot of the trout habitat. So when you see a channel like this, you know that's a low energy channel. By God, there's wetlands uh, responsible for a good chunk of why that exists. Lake fish habitat. A lot of us know muskies and, and northerns especially are famous for needing wetlands for their spawning. They have to go out of the lakes and go up into wetlands to lay their eggs. And in some areas of state, walleyes do the same and some other fish. So very important. And wildlife habitat. Of course, we all know about ducks and everything else uh, using wetlands and blackbirds and, and all that. These are two different species of cranes. There's a sandhill crane on the left and a whooping crane on the right. And after a lot of study on this photo, I finally figured out what the difference is between a sandhill crane and a whooping crane. Those whooping cranes have those crazy colors on their legs. And so, yeah, that's one good tip for you bird watchers out there if you're, if you're wondering what it is. But seriously, there's been so much study on the, sand, on the whooping cranes now, it's hard to find one that doesn't have leg markings because they're studying them so carefully. And, and importantly so, they're, they're on the increase. So that's really... A success and the Sandhill Crane story, of course, is a grand success story in Wisconsin and across the nation. Wetlands are great for recreation, whether you're boating, whether you're hunting, whether you're just out mucking around and exploring plants and animals. A uh, great place to great place to be. I'd rather be in a wetland than just about anywhere else. Of course, education, teaching our kids about diversity and wildlife and all those things. Uh, great, great places. And cultural uses. Uh, in the introduction, you heard that I worked uh, for many years for the Yakima Nation. And this, these are tule mats. Tules are bulrush. So out west, uh, and I think that was also true in Wisconsin, but a lot of the tribes then would harvest bulrush, hard stem bulrush, and, and make, make them into mats. They call them tule mats. And uh, they would use them for all their structures, and they're very waterproof because when the rain comes, those bulrushes swell, and they keep a pretty watertight uh, situation. So really important. Uh, we were doing a lot of wetland management out there, uh, really um, using techniques to grow the best tules we could. And then they'd come out and harvest them. It was really good. It was also really good waterfowl habitat. So historically, Wisconsin was a very wetland-rich state. Uh, we had 10 million acres of wetlands uh, in Wisconsin historically. That's, you know, 
20, between 20 and 30 percent of the state was wetland. That means one wet foot every three or four steps, right? That's a lot of wetlands. But we've changed the way water flows across our landscape. We've done a lot of things. We've been busy kids over the last, you know, 100, 200 years. Urban development, transportation, building roads, upper watershed conversion. Where's the easiest place to drain? Those upper watershed areas, right? And that's so a lot of those got lost uh, because they were so easy to, to drain. Uh, drainage and channelization, climate change over top of all this stuff is making it even worse, and then wetland and floodplain loss. That, uh, that structure on the left-hand picture there, uh, incidentally, that's the dredge they used to drain Horicon Marsh. It was so big, people lived on that dredge. And of course, now we're working really hard to put Horicon back, and it's, and it's, it's really difficult. So like I said, we had historically 10 million acres of wetlands in Wisconsin. We've lost half of our wetlands. We've got estimates, you know, it's hard to estimate uh, historic and even current conditions, but generally we've lost half of the wetlands that we've had. And you can't remove half of the wetlands in a state without significant implications to the other water and other resources in the area. And a lot of the wetlands we have left are in pretty tough shape. Because of alterations, the wetlands may still be there, but the hydrology has changed or other disturbances have happened. Maybe a lot of nutrients are coming in and they're really in tough condition, especially with invasive species. And it's not spread out equally. equally. When you look at a map, and this is an old map, I need to update this, but when you look at a map of wetland loss in Wisconsin, it's literally the, you know, the bottom you know, two thirds of the state is where most of it's gone on. You go to the northern part of the state, there's beautiful, gorgeous, abundant wetlands, especially in those in those areas where we have a lot of healthy lakes. And guess what? Those lakes are healthy. A big part of that is because there's abundant wetlands in those landscapes. When I go and give these talks up in, in lake country, I'll ask people, oh, you know, we have 10,000 acres of lakes in this county. How many acres of wetlands do you think we have? And then people say, oh, maybe 25% of that, maybe 30%, I don't know. Well, in those areas, we have four to five times the amount of wetland acreage in those counties than as we do lake acreage. People don't notice them. You'll notice a lake because you think you want to go fish there or boat or whatever. You don't notice all that acreage of wetland keeping those lakes healthy and clean. If you take a map, and, and, I'll, and I'll do this one day, but if you take a map of our, um, our uh, disturbed waterways um, and lay it over top, of the wetland loss map, they match up almost perfectly, the impaired waterways. Uh, so no surprise there, right? Lose your wetlands, you degrade all your other waters. Like I say, many of the wetlands we have left are in very poor condition, but not this one, right? Isn't this a nice wetland? No, this one is really tough shape. This is hybrid cattail. Hybrid cattail is ubiquitous now across Wisconsin. And what happened was, you know, we had a native cattail here that was good habitat, and we were known, Wisconsin, this area was known for its cattail marshes. A couple of species moved up from the south and hybridized with the native broadleaf cattail that we had here and created what we call a hybrid cattail. And it grows in so thick, so differently than the native cattail. A place like this is almost a biological desert. Uh, you've got very low diversity in places like this. You'll have some blackbirds nesting in there and a few other things, but not much else. So we've got a lot of work to do, not only to protect the wetlands, a few wetlands we got left, but get health back to the, to the other wetlands uh, that are in poor shape. And wetland loss brings challenges, like I said. This is up in uh, near Ashland. One rain event caused over $35 million in public infrastructure damage. And this is just one of many, many road washouts that occurred in one rain event in 2016 in the Marengo watershed. And uh, when you start looking at where the damage occurred up in that, in that rain event, and they've had a couple since then, and then you look at where wetlands have been lost on those watersheds, they line up really well. So upstream of these places, a lot of wetland lost. Places that didn't wash out, you see healthy wetlands above there. So a real important wetland story. Wetlands aren't the only thing that caused this, of course, but wetland loss was a big part of uh, contributing to this kind of damage. And there were two lives lost in that, in that flood event, by the way. 
So floodplain disconnection, a big part of it. We've got to spread that water out. We've got to reduce that energy. So here's what happens. And the top picture is, you know, more normal, healthy floodplain channel uh, where they interact. And you can see kind of the narrow, shallow channel. And when the, when the flows come down, it spreads out. Uh, the energy is reduced and uh, things go really well. When you levy that off or reduce the ability for, for that water to spread out in a floodplain, all that water stays in the channel, right? So all that energy stays in the channel and things start to happen. The channel has to change its form. And a lot of times what it does, it digs itself deeper and deeper and deeper to handle those flashy flood events. That's called incision because the, the creek incises itself down. And it gets to the point where it takes a really, really big flood before uh, that water can spread out and, and lose its energy. And with all that energy in the channels flowing downstream, what's downstream? Bridges, towns, villages, cities, things like that, where we don't want that kind of water coming at it. So floodplain loss has been incredibly important uh, to, to, as a cause of damage. Uh, in Wisconsin. And here's a, here's a situation where deposition and incision have, have come on. By removing our upper watershed wetlands, what we've done, this is the driftless area, and a lot of uh, prairies have been lost up there as well, it caused all kinds of erosion. And all the dirt that used to be up on the hills then washed down and covered over. Remember that channel I showed you that used to be uh, a driftless uh, creek flowing through that big wetland? All those wetlands got buried in that area in four, five, six feet of, of sediment in the course of just a few decades when, when farming started in that landscape. And that's covered the floodplain. So it, took a, it takes a big flood now to get out over that, uh, the deposition layer of all that soil that used to be up in the hills, and now it's down in the valleys. And because of that, it's not spreading out anymore. There's even more water coming and the creek, even a even on top of it is digging itself deeper and deeper and deeper. And you can tell by the types of soils. On the, where it says deposition, the bottom of that bar there, there's a black line. Those are the old wetland soils. That, this is actually West Fork of Kickapoo River. And uh, it's been digging itself deeper even below the deposition zone. So when you get a situ situation like that, you are really out of whack from an energy standpoint and a hydrology standpoint. And we're flooding new areas. Uh, this is actually in the Little Plover River watershed. Uh, uh, flood flows are going in places where it never had before because of alterations. Our rivers are running dirty. Here's two rivers uh, up in Bayfield, um, taken 45 minutes apart. The one on the left has healthy water or wetlands in the upper watershed. The one on the right doesn't. So you can see the sediment. You can see the eroded banks. That energy is going right down the channel. Ditching and tiling is, is also reducing our groundwater levels. So many of our wetlands are groundwater dependent here. It's water upwelling into these wetlands, providing these you know, gorgeous and, and really biodiverse uh, situations. Tiling and drainage is designed to reduce groundwater levels and uh, has dried up a lot of our wetlands. And they act as, as stormwater conveyances too, flushing storm flows downstream. So some of our waters are drying up. And we all know about Little Plover River, famously is, infamously, I guess, has dried up a few times. This is not the Little Plover River. This is one nobody ever talks about. This is uh, Duck Creek in Adams County. Uh, same, same problems happening there. Some areas are even wetter. Well, think about this. If we remove all our wetlands in the upper part of the watershed and force all that water to flush downstream, it's getting drier up at the top. It gets wetter down at the bottom. And we've really seen that, especially in Adams County in the last few years. But that water's got to go somewhere. Where does it go? In these low areas. Sometimes we're flooding uh, neighborhoods. Sometimes we're flooding farm fields, etc. And our lands are eroding. This is the driftless area. This is the top of the hill on a driftless area, the beginning of a gorge. What you don't see, this was historically, even though it's the top of the hill, this was a sedge meadow. Behind uh, this person looking down here, uh, there's a about a 40 acre impervious surface development that shuts, you know, sh sends all its water into this poor old wetland and it got overwhelmed and it just started, you know, developing this giant canyon and it gets worse as it goes downstream. And it will continue to get worse as that, as those high, high runoff events uh, go into that wetland. 
and this is the end result. You know, this is Coon Creek. This is the photo that launched the Soil Conservation Service, very famous photo. You can't fix this. How do you, how do you fix this? You can't put all that soil back once something like this has happened, so you've got to come up with new things. And our communities are suffering. So you look at a lot of our towns and villages in Wisconsin, 70% of their budgets annually, when there isn't a flood, goes to road repair. What happens when you're a village or a town and this happens? This is a road washout. Uh, it's really expensive. So how do we turn this around? From our perspective, wetlands as solutions are a big part of what needs to be done here in Wisconsin. And when you look at it, regulations aren't enough. We need to go beyond it. So we've got 5 million acres of wetlands left. Wetland protection is incredibly important. We have to protect those 5 million acres. But protection just keeps the status quo. We've got to start putting wetlands back on the landscape where they've been lost in the right locations to address the issues that we're experiencing right now. That means restoration and management and care uh, of wetlands. So that means taking a watershed approach. We don't have enough money, of course. We can't put all the wetlands back, the 5 million acres. So let's get smart. Let's take a watershed approach and understand where do we need to put how much wetlands to address the water issues that are occurring in one watershed or another. And the answer is different from watershed to watershed. <laughs> and so we need a lot more of these wetlands back in the right locations. Unfortunately, conservation has often been random. Hey, we've got money for wetlands. Who wants to sign up? And the money gets spent to whoever likes ducks or something. So let's start looking at our watershed needs, working with our communities, and uh, uh, prioritizing the most important places and get that water holding capacity uh, back on the landscape. There isn't enough money, so we've got to be smart on how we're spending it. And we don't need hundreds or thousands of acres of wetlands back. We need hundreds of thousands of wetland acres back in Wisconsin if we're going to seriously restore the health back to a lot of our watersheds. And we always say wetlands aren't the only things we need, but we can't fix them without wetlands. And wetlands oftentimes have gotten lip service, but not a whole lot of serious consideration in the work we're doing, landscape and watershed scale work that's been going on around here. So how do we get this amount of wetlands back on the landscape? It really means working with communities to help them understand why wetlands and how they can be solutions to the water issues that they're facing. And the idea is we're not going to get everybody to love ducks or frogs or pretty flowers, and that motivates some people for wetlands work. We've got to get people understanding why wetlands are important to the things that they do care about. So in other words, a town or a village, they care about not having to spend a lot of money repairing roads. Hey, guess what? Wetlands can be a cost-effective solution to the problem you have. So a lot of the work we do is helping people understand why wetlands are important to the things they do care about. And I hope they also care about ducks and frogs and pretty flowers, but, you know, we need something to motivate people to put these back. And we have to work with landowners. Look at this statistic here. 75% of Wisconsin wetlands are on private ownership right now. We think of the Horicon marshes and some of these big areas, and we think, oh, yeah, that's where the wetlands are. No, that's all that public land is only 25% of our wetlands. So if we're going to protect the wetlands we've got, we've got to be working with private landowners. And look at this bottom statistic. 85% of the wetlands that were lost but could be brought back are also on private land. So we have got to work with private landowners if we're going to get uh, the amount of acreage back on the landscape that we need. And that's really hard sometimes, isn't it? We have to make caring for wetlands the norm for landowners. So everybody, of course, we're caring for our wetlands. Of course, we're, we're bringing them back. It's all about viewing wetlands as solutions. So if you're in an agricultural landscape, working with landowners in an agricultural area to help manage their runoff or help uh, with different things that are the problems that they're having either on farm or in their community in an urban area, same thing. And thinking about uh, taking that watershed approach, getting people to understand uh, that wetlands can do a lot of good uh, for the things that they care about. So remember, in conclusion, save all the parts. Remember that Harrier we talked about? 
who would have thought that a that a predator would be important to helping the success of of ground nesting birds there's stuff going on in nature we we know only a little tiny tiny bit of it so like leopold said save those parts don't throw them away we've got to protect what we've got because when we start screwing around and messing things up we have no idea the damage we're causing and uh and it can be immense sometimes in our arrogance as we start messing around with things so think about how things function and and keep them together and care for it and they will come it's amazing when you start putting some of the water back in the right way in the right locations the plants and the wildlife and the effects that uh, really key in on on those areas being restored and cared for and diversity matters we're going to have to keep increasing the diversity on our landscape that's our protection that's our sustainability moving forward I counted one time there's like 30 different species in this photo and uh, that's diversity kids that's diversity in a cattail hybrid cattail marsh there's one plant in there and don't dig here this is a really high quality wetland and we get so many people calling us up saying I want to improve my area for for ducks or wildlife I want to dig a duck pond and I'll go out and I'll see something like this this is a gorgeous native sedge meadow and don't dig this up this is actually good duck habitat too and volunteer get out get out in nature you you protect the things you care about so get out there all the time and and help and support groups that are working for wetlands this is stone lake community they they're restoring wetlands between their developed area and stone lake to keep the water that flows into stone lake clean and they're celebrating it they've got a whole wetland park now it's really neat and we've got a, a restoration bill coming up i always like to to if if uh, if you'd like to talk to your senators uh there's a bill now uh, up um, through the committees in the Senate and the Assembly that will help make it easier for private landowners to do the good things that need to be done to restore hydrology on their landscape. It'll create a general permit. It's made it through uh, the Senate uh, floor on a voice vote. So it's through the Senate. Uh, hopefully it'll be up soon in the Assembly so you can call your uh, representative and uh, tell them to support AB 85 SB 91. And if you're interested in wetlands, join Wisconsin Wetlands Association. We'd love to have you as members. And uh, we have newsletters and a lot of information uh, to help you protect and care for the wetlands in your area. But most importantly, get out there, get your feet wet. And when you do, bring a friend. <laughs> That's my friend. He's passed on now. Though, but. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your attention. And... Uh, Hope it was of interest to you, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Tracy. That was great. I'm going to um, repeat our telephone number for those out there who may want to call in a question. It's 715-942-9917. And I do have a question on our Facebook page. First of all, a thank you. And this is from uh, Mary Stoddard Trainer. She's a former trustee of ours and a biologist. So her question is, have you been able to educate the DNR and our state politicians regarding wetlands as they are setting policy regarding development and water management? I think you addressed that somewhat, but you may want to elaborate a little, a little. bit. Yeah, so this is something that's a real high priority for our organization. We do a lot of policy work. And, you know, we've had, how do I put this simply? You know, we've had a lot of years recently of a lot of wetland bills coming up. And oftentimes these bills would come up because a landowner would talk to, uh, you know, their representative and say, I've got this problem, can you fix it? And, and some bill would pop up. And uh, our organization then, we called these flaming ducks. So if you're sitting at your desk and you're working on something that you need to be working on and someone comes through your office and throws a flaming duck on your desk, you have to stop what you're doing and deal with the flaming duck, right? The, all these bills that were coming out were flaming ducks. We had to stop everything and deal with this or that. And it got really, really difficult uh, because there were multiple of these coming every year and some bigger than others, right? And some of the times they were contradictory even. So it was kind of chaos. So we really decided that, you know what, we've got to figure out a way to get everybody thinking about wetlands a little bit differently and understanding why wetlands are important to the things, you know, like I said, that they care about. So what did we do? 
we started calling up folks, saying, uh, especially our, our senators and, and assembly folks, and saying, hey, we'd love to get you out in your district and, and talk about wetlands with you. So we've been doing that a lot the last few years, and uh, it's been really effective. What we're trying to do literally is get wetlands out of politics right now. We don't want it to be a partisan, a partisan issue. Let's get everybody caring about wetlands and working together um, to help protect and, and bring the wetlands back where we need them. Because when you have conservation policy on a pendulum, you know, oh, this party does something and the next party gets in power and they undo it and then they do it and back and forth, that doesn't work in the long run. You've got to get everybody understanding what we've got to do and working together to uh, protect these things. So I'm really um, encouraged, cautiously optimistic, I should say, that uh, we're starting to get that way now. And a lot of folks are starting to see our decision makers, why wetlands are important. The other thing that, good thing that came out, um, it was a really bad bill. I know when we fought it really hard uh, a few years ago, the isolated wetlands bill. And one of the things that we actually in the compromise got put in there uh, was a thing called the Wetlands Study Council. And we approached you know, the folks and said, look, we are so tired of these flaming ducks coming. All, and they were too, because they would get killed by their constituents every time a wetland bill would, could come up. So we created this thing called the Wetlands Study Council uh, in that isolated wetlands bill. That was a good thing that came out of that bill. Um, so now folks come together, uh, meet bi-monthly, and we're, we're part of it. And, and developers and realtors, stakeholders, conservation people all come together and deal with wetland issues. And the idea is let's you know, work out some of these nasty issues before a bill gets developed or something happens at DNR or this or that happens. Work it out and, and let's help folks uh, do good things and, and create good wetland policy. And if we can get that pendulum you know, a little more stabilized and get everybody protecting and, and restoring wetlands, that's a good thing. Is it perfect? No. Do we have a long way to go? Of course. But I'm optimistic that there's progress being made right now. I have a question. How do you actually restore a wetland once it's been Yeah, good question. <laughs> it's really, really hard. Many of our wetlands took 10,000 years to form, right? Especially since the glacial times and, and the driftless even longer than that. So you can't just go in and do a few things and say, hey, hey I got a wetland back. Uh, unfortunately, it's a reality. So that's why it's so important. I'm, I've done my whole career restoring wetlands. It's a fairly new science. But um, all of us wetland restoration people understand the importance of protecting stuff that's already there because we can't create that, at least not in the short term. Maybe in a few thousand years, some of the work we're restoring will have, have those characteristics, but it ain't happen, happening in our lifetime. So... When you think about restoring wetlands, and it's something we have to do because we've lost so many, we've got to get them back. Even though they're not going to be perfect, um, we've got to start. And what that means is, I always say, fixing the water first. Find out what's been altered in that area, and then use that as a model in a modern context to bring back the conditions that will help uh, promote the conditions we need that wetlands provide, whether it be flood control, water quality, uh, vegetation communities, wildlife, et cetera, et cetera. Oftentimes people go in and they want to create like, you know, the duck pond situation. Uh, we've got to get away from that and understand how these areas, these wetlands that we want to restore functioned historically, what we've changed, and how can we bring some semblance of that back in a modern context? And that's a that's the fun and the challenge of this kind of work, and it isn't easy, and there's no recipe books for this kind of stuff. It takes interdisciplinary groups of folks to, to put it together. All right. I have another question. Okay. So um, my career has been in mostly building construction, and most jurisdictions have a requirement to uh, retain runoff, whether it's from roofs or yeah, parking lots or whatever. Is that effective in slowing down the energy of It's of really important events? because when you have water coming off a parking lot or a roof, that's carrying a lot of nasty stuff. You know, my old truck's dripping oil on that parking lot, right? And that's rushing it right off. I mean, salt 
you know, we're really learning how salt is affecting our waterways now. And so those types of things to handle that flush right off of that thing is, is really important. But they work differently than wetlands. A lot of people say, well, can't we just use wetlands for that storm? And it, remember that picture with the big gorge? Yeah, that was a wetland taking water right off of that impervious surface, and it overwhelmed it and, and blew it out. So we need those things to slow that down, but we need to incorporate wetlands as well in our landscape design. And there's a lot of really exciting stuff now uh, where people are looking at, even in, in, in housing development areas, how can we incorporate wetlands or protect the wetlands in this area to help manage the runoff? And they work differently. So you got to have your stormwater conveyance features, but as the water flows on through, then you can have wetlands helping reduce the floods and clean the water and do all these types of things and provide the habitat. So incredibly important, and I'm optimistic because I think people are getting more and more interested in incorporating wetlands considerations in development. Long way to go, though, I will say. Don't, don't, this isn't any rosy thing yet, but we're working that direction. <laughs> All right. Well, good. Thank you, Tracy. You addressed a lot of my questions before we even got to the Q&A. <laughs> well, I appreciate the time, everybody, and, and your interest in wetlands. And, of course, uh, please check out our website, wisconsinwetlands.org. And if you're interested in wetlands, we would love you to be a member. Any size donation makes you a member, and you'll get newsletters and things like that from us. So, um, And if you have questions, we're happy to talk to folks and uh, answer any questions if we can. And sometimes I'm traveling around the state if people have a wet, uh, wetland issue. Sometimes I'm able to visit uh, their land and, and, uh, and uh, look at it. It's fun for me to do that anyway. So appreciate your time. Appreciate your interest. So have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.